what your word says. For we do all these things in your son's name. Amen. Now, this morning we are doing something different. I always like saying that, especially in church. You want to know why? It makes people have heart palpitations, right? <laughs> We're doing something different. <gasps> It's okay. This is only for four weeks, and then I promise I'll do something different again. Okay? I, I can only guarantee a, a difference of about four weeks, and then I'm, I've, I've got to start again. But this morning's going to sound a little bit different. It's going to be doing, a, it's going to function a little bit different because I, I'm going to need some interaction with you, okay? And uh, I'm not going to take the camera and turn it around. Just, if you're watching on Facebook, you just have to accept the fact that you're not going to see some of this, okay? I want you to think back when, okay? I love doing these things. Let's think back when. What did, uh, what did church look like when you started going? Okay, so not, not Lighthouse. We're going to talk about Lighthouse in just a second. I want you to go back to your original, I don't, want to, I, I don't like using the word home church, but the church that you started going to. What did that church look like? What did, uh, what did it have? Now, I'm going to tell you. I can only share from, I can't share what your church looked like. I can only share what Whittier Missionary Baptist Church looked like in Whittier, okay? When we first started going there, it had green carpet. The pews had no cushion on them whatsoever. There were these crushed velvet curtains that hung on the stage. It was all green. And, and it was probably pretty or it was popular at some point in time. I don't know when that time was. <laughs> we had a we had a pulpit that I think came out came off the ark because it was heavier than I'll get out. Um, and then we had uh, stained glass windows that barely worked. Um, only three or four of them opened. There was no air conditioning. No. The fans the fans only worked half the time. And you had to convince uh, one of the deacon's wives to allow you to turn on the fan because she was always cold. Right? Sound, does this sound familiar to anybody? All right. What your church looked like probably looked a little bit different. Now, I do have some show and tell things. Now, now we didn't stay in the symbol, but how many of you know what the symbol is? This is what, what we were growing up to, always called the old red church symbol. Okay. There was a man by the name of Clifton Davis who was sung tenor, and I was little enough, and look, okay, small country church, my dad sang in the choir, my mom played the piano, so guess what happened when it was time to go sing in the choir? Guess where the three kids went? We went and sung in the choir, okay? Uh, this is one of those old hymnals that actually have shade notes, and once upon a time, I could actually read shade notes, because that's how Clifton taught them to me, that's all, I mean, that's just how it worked. And then I remember the good old 6 8 time, right? You always do when a choir was singing good 6 8 time. Why? They, always, they were always rock. Even bad. So we don't dance. But the good, the good 6 8 choir song would be, you know, they'd always be. You always had that one alto, too, right? That one alto who probably got a little bit too free in the spirit. It was just a little bit, you know, bouncing a little bit too much. I remember the first sermon that I preached. This is actually the, the Bible that I probably preached it out of. And I was showing, uh, I was actually showing Ruthie um, my first sermon because the church I grew up in, having notes or having a computer was not, not a thing. Okay? I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you how I grew up. I was scared to death about preaching. And so I thought it almost as I want you to know, I kind of got this as cheating, okay, when I first started. And I don't know if you can see this, but on here, this is, a, this is an eight-point sermon on a post-it note. All right? There's eight points on it. I, it took me a while to read it because I have to, you know, my vision's got a little. Eight points. And I'm going, good night. Eight-point sermons, and that would take me three days. Um, but I remember that. Right? And you probably did too. Probably something to, to, those, to those same lines. Now let's think about something else. What were some of the traditions that you did? Okay? Every church has a tradition. Good, right, wrong, indifferent. What were some, what were some of the ones that you did? 
Um, at Whittier, we, for whatever reason, we couldn't eat at the church. I don't know why. We always had to go across the railroad tracks to the community center that's, that's across, across the railroad tracks. The reason that I'm able to tell you this is because my family will never let me live it down. Um, it was an Easter Sunday, or it was like one of those times, and it was our family's responsibility to bring the ham. I got across the first set of railroad tracks absolutely fine. Guess what happened to the second set? I tripped and fell and spilled the ham everywhere. My family still won't let me live that down, and that was 20 some years ago. Why? Because that was part of our tradition, right? We always went over there. We always had the Christmas. Uh, we always had the Christmas uh, play that had like three kids in it, and I was one of those kids, and I was the kid that always had all the lines memorized. And I was speeding lines to everybody else on stage because they didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> but, I mean, I can even take you back to revivals. And I can take you back to, I mean, if you want to go an old school, like, 1900 revival, go up to Smoke Mont in August. Okay? Um, they have a, they do a, it's a church that's up there, it's on the park. You only get to go in it for one week out of the year. I've been there. There's... There's barely electricity. Um, there is no air conditioning, and if you're, if you're, if you're at the right time of year, the bats actually fly through the windows up onto the onto the onto the walls. I actually know the guys who are responsible for going in there, kid you not, and making sure there's no snakes in the building before service is held. All right, they're well chosen. It's good. Okay. I tell you all of this because we can go back. We can think back about a lot of different things, right? Now I want you to do it for us personally. So this is what I want you to do. So again, I'm sorry, uh, Facebook Live, not being able to do this. So I'm asking you, I want you to look around. If you've been here, and I know some of you have, if you've been here at Lighthouse since 2004, 2005, and I understand Lighthouse actually started a little bit before then. If you've been here since then, could you just raise your hand for me? Got a rear tongue. Uh, so look around. I want, I want you to look around real quick. So, okay, so for my group that's here, the, the, for you that just raised your hands, let me ask you, how many things have changed since, since those very beginning days? If you go back and you think about it, for my, okay, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm reiterating history that's been told to me. You've had at least three locations, Right? One point in time, you were meeting in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and some are shaking hands, so I got that part right. You've had a couple of different addresses. I know that because I found the letterheads on some things. I'm like, when were you all here? Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, things have changed, right? And I want you to know, and this is this is for those who are like who like the things. Here's can I tell you the sad part? And I use I use pop pop culture references for this. There is no there is no Doctor Who box. There's no there's no DeLorean parked out back, and there's not even an Infinity Stone for us to reverse time, right? We we can long for those days, but what what can we do about it? outside of just kind of longing? Number two is one other thing that we can do is we can actually tell others about them. Uh, I, I'm probably, and I've, I've said this to a couple of people, I'm probably the last of the generation that you could say, no, you could talk about having going to a tent revival to. I know what that is. I, I, I remember going to, uh, when churches, especially around here, used to have revivals, and they'd talk to each other. Hey, we're planning on having a revival. Well, who's speaking of yours? Well, what happens if it goes longer than four days? What happens if it goes longer for the week and week and a half? Two weeks. Used to be wonderful. Well, yeah. Used but, to be wonderful. And now you're going, hey, we're going to have something on a Saturday afternoon for three hours. Oh, I don't know if I can. Right? Uh, I can't remember the church, but I do remember. I, I, can, I cannot tell you where it was at. I really wish I could. If my dad was here, he probably could tell you. But I remember going to a revival, and I remember it being so hot. It was the middle of summer. My mom would not let us wear short pants, so we were all in jeans. It was 90 degrees. There was not air conditioning in that church at all. And I remember getting there, and we got there early enough 
that I got to sit next to the one stained glass window that I made sure was open. Right? And there's like, it's time for us to go sing. Hey, everybody come sing. Nope. I am not. I shall not. Why? Because if I get up, what's going to happen? Someone's going to take my seat. And now I'm going to be stuck in the amen pew over there next to, uh, to Lenny Nations and not be able to withstand it, right? If you know Lenny, you understand that, you understand that joke. Love him to death. I say all of this, why? Because we're going to talk about unity. Over the next couple of weeks, it's going to look differently, okay? The stage is looking a little bit differently. Next week's going to definitely look differently because of, of some other things. But this is what I, I want us to think about. And understand that I'm talking about this from a positive standpoint. I do not talk about this from a negative standpoint. I will never stand back and say, look, what you used to do is wrong. That's not me. Okay? Now, I can look back at what people did in the 1600s. Yeah, I can argue all day about those things. Why? <laughs> They're not here. <laughs> I win. Um, but we do need to understand that there's things that change and there's things that do not change. Right? Inside a church. Now, I'm looking at us as, as a church. So, what are some things that do change? The who. Look at no, so my people that raise your hands. There are people that you started at Lighthouse with that have they're not here anymore. Some of them have went on to other churches. Some of them have went on to glory. Right? They they they've had their they've had their, their true home going. And they're, 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 so the, the group is different. Look around. Okay? Does that make it right and wrong? No? That's just understanding. The wind, the wear has changed. We already talked about that. Different location. But let's just go back to last year. Okay? When I first started accepting as uh, your, your interim pastor, <laughs> I spent two and a half months not even being able to see you. <laughs> right? Where, where were you? Because I was in Tennessee. Talking to you through, uh, through that little red phone that's sitting right there. That, so the, the where changes. The when. They, you can think back. Hey, you know, we used to have Sunday school at 930. We had Sunday school at 10. The worship moves around a little bit. We used to, you know, there used to be a, a Monday night Discipleship, look, okay, look, I grew up in a small country church, which means that whenever the church doors were open, we were there unless we were playing football, okay? Like, that's kind of our life. The how. The how is changing. Could you imagine going back, let's, let's, and let's say in pretty relevant terms, let's go back five years, let's go back six years. If I told you that the majority of Christians today are watching at least some church services on their phone, how many of you would believe me? You're going, I, I don't know. But you think about it now, and you're going, oh, obviously I would. You see, the how is even changing. And we go back to it. I mean, I can go back to, uh, again, I mean, I can, I can let you look at this. You can't take it, because this is my only copy. We went from, you know, I remember singing from, I don't think so. And I remember, you know, that was uh, that was during the all who, all who can and will, and doesn't necessarily mean that you can carry a tune in a bucket, but hey, all who can and will. But what are things that do not change in church? Well, the only two that we have left is our what and our why. What? We are a church. God has God has told us that from the very beginning. Uh, from the day of Pentecost, it says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not. Really? Yes, thank you. Hey, my Sunday school lessons are better. Someone's been paying attention to Sunday school class. So excited. <laughs> we are still a church. Why? That's still the same, too. Why? Because God's called us to do a couple of things. Number one, He's called us to do unity. Number two, He's called us to be a church. Number three, he's called us to a lost and dying world that is in constant need of understanding Christ as Savior. Those do not change. Now, what's the biggest difference? What's the biggest difference between these two lists? Can I tell you that, can I show you the biggest difference? And I'm, I'm not saying again, this is just something that we need to understand. 
is this one word right here. Time. If God allows, guess what? At some point in time, you and I will not be here. Okay? We just have to... That's change, right? But we have to breathe. Okay, I can accept that. My, my who will change, my, my when might change. Well, let's be, have you been paying attention to our, our friends up north? The government came in at a church and literally put a fence around them. Put their, put their pastor in jail, all in the name of health safety. I kid you not, go look it up. You can Google it while you're sitting there. They put a fence around the building, allowing, not allowing people to even come onto the property. Huh. Can you say that their wind has changed? Yeah, probably. Their wares changed. All of these things. Why? One word. Time. So what do we do? I want you to know, we can easily, easily sit here and just go, you know what, Pastor? Let's just, let's just give up. All right? We can just give up. We can just stop. And I want you to know the whole world will be very happy about that. Is that what we're going to do? That's a, that's, that's a rhetorical question. The answer that's no. Okay? I'm giving you the answer to that rhetorical question. What I do need you to do is, is turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read some very familiar verses. We're going to read two verses to you. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. For you that have done scripture memory, this is probably some of those things that you probably have memorized. I always point that out in case, you, uh, in case you're, you're struggling with your scripture memory. Great place to start. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We can make all sorts of excuses. I, I, don't, you know, I, I don't know people. I don't understand. Okay, great. I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 today. And I want us to, and while we're doing that, uh, at some point in time I can, um, the Bible I'm preaching out of, this used to be my preaching Bible. The, the words got too little um, at some point in time. So, uh, but in my preaching Bible, these lines have been underlined. So it means I preached on it at some point in time. Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. I want you to read this, but I want you to read it for number 1. You see the word up there, as a form of preparation. Okay? We understand things are changing. We understand some things don't change. How do we get ready for it? Love the question. Why? Well, because Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings, to, clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, exactly what you heard in the psalm just before, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I read it to you, and I'm kind of quoting it at the same time because I've read it so many times. But let's talk about the preparation of this. Let's talk about the preparation of the things that are changing around us, and what do we do about it? Okay, so let's go into that. The first thing that he says in there is actually says, lay aside. Now, I'm going to get back to the weeds and plurals and all those things here in just a moment. But the very first thing we need to focus on is lay aside. Lay aside what? Every weight. I love that. Lay, I, obviously, I would. Uh, for you guys that have done any type of construction or those types of things, you know, whenever I think about a weight, I always think about like a 50-pound bag of like concrete mix. Why? Because it's just heavy. It does nothing. It helps you, it doesn't help you, like, it's just, it's hard to move, right? I imagine whenever, whenever Paul's talking about this, imagine someone trying to run and trying to carry two or three of those at the same time. I don't know about you, but I probably couldn't run that far, right? But he says, lay aside every weight. And I love this. So what, what would be some of those weights that we need to get rid of if we're going to think about a church that's going to continually move forward? If we're going to talk about a church that's not going to worry about change, but worry more about unity, what would that be? Huh. Number one is worries. I don't know. Okay. No show of hands because every hand probably would go up, especially every female that's here. When's the last time you worried? Okay. 
Was it, le was it less than, um, no, I don't know, 15 minutes ago? Um, I have a worry every time the kids walk out of the church to go back to children's church. Why? Because I'd be that one kid that would have went the wrong way. <laughs> and that's a small building. But let's talk about worries. Now, these worries are not just common, but these are truly deep-seated worries. Worries that says, I, I gotta hang on. I gotta hang on because no one else is. That's that's a that's a sinful word. I want you to think about it. If I if the, look, we don't have the wood too far around us to find this, right? I'm so worried about the way the world's going. I'm going to go and cling to something that, that worked in 67 years ago. Right? I I'm worried. I'm worried that it's just going to change, and, and, and you, you can almost hear them hyper hyperventilate, right? I, I, I have a cousin-in-law. He cannot, like he's, like he, whenever he talks, starts talking about change, he starts hyperventilating, and he's a deacon on the, at a church that way. I will not tell you where it's at, because you all know it. He, he starts hyperventilating. You're going to change? Oh, no. Number two, wait to set aside personal concerns. I, I know I wanted to help define this a little bit more because as I, as I kept studying and as I kept saying it, it made sense in my head, but I want to make sure you understood this. How will this benefit me? You ever seen that, you ever seen that mindset? Oh, my goodness. <coughs> Pastor, I need, you, I need for you to start a ministry just for me. Well, I'm sorry, I don't have a whole lot of, you know, 36-year-old female singles with three kids ministering options. I had that in previous church. She got upset and left because I couldn't find a ministry just for her. I don't know if she ever found a ministry. I want you to know that. Because what was she, what was she going into church with? Consumer mentality. Oh, I wonder what I'm going to get out of this. Or another way of looking at it is, uh, I, I usually call it, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have membership mentality. Oh, I'm a member there, so it should be for me. Right? Laying aside things means I'm going to try to, I'm going to learn how will, how will this benefit me? Well, lay it aside because what is, how does God tell us to do? How does God teach us to be a servant, to be loving on one another, to continue to say, hey, you have that need? Let me pray for you. Let me see what else I can do for you. Not just, okay, that's good. Let me, let me, let me give you an arm's length, right? Look, look back. Think back. You can, I promise you, you're doing exactly like I'm doing. I can picture people one after another after another. The, all these examples are nothing Nothing new. I've probably been one of those examples, right? I've done that. Hey, that's, uh, I'm so sorry about your situation. There's nothing I can really do. Let me, let me pray for you. What I'm really saying is, this is not going to benefit me. Let me figure out something else. Excuses. Uh, that was an excuse. Uh, I actually have written on here. It's a, it's a, I'm reading a book uh, about the uh, about the uh, 2008 basketball uh, goal team, and I, the title of the chapter I'm on right now is "What's Your Excuse Now?" I love that title because they they, they literally looked at each other and they're like, "So what's the excuse now?" And whenever you look at other people and you ask them that question, guess what happens? People stop talking. Because I'm looking you in the eye. What's the excuse now? Is it, oh, well, we're, we're not reaching, you know, I can't watch, I can't watch online. Okay, so what's your excuse now? Hey, we're not meeting in person. Okay, what's your excuse now? Tell me. I would, Tell me, because I'll probably, I'll probably figure out a way of, of answering it. That's probably why people don't tell me their excuses anymore. Fear of change. Worries and fear of change are kind of the same thing, but they're, you, 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 
met these people, any point of change will just... That's the reason why usually whenever I say, hey, look, I'm changing things, and I say that often, I do that on purpose. I do that intentionally. Why? Because I want you to know, things are constantly changing. Constantly. We need to be able to go, okay, things are changing. What does not change? God's word. Never changes. Ever. So I keep, I, this is the reason why I keep going back to it. I keep studying and keep learning from it and I keep trying to teach it because what's what? The world's going crazy, but guess what? It's went crazy before. You think you have a bad leader? Go back and read. Read. There's a king who got turned into a beast. You think God's not, God doesn't know what's happening? Psh, please. This is not the first time. Go read your Old Testament. There's some weird things that the kings have done in the past. And we're over here complaining now. <laughs> I can just see Daniel looking at us going, seriously? You're worried about that? Try going and living in a different country for the rest of your life and not knowing if you're going to ever see home again. That's what Daniel thinks. And we're going, but I'm, I'm, I'm worried things are, things are going to change. Breathe. Talk about what God has already done and what God is going to do. And sin. I always like this. He gives lay, lay, lay aside every weight and sin. How do we define this? The sin that has the greatest advantage against us is the circumstances we're in. Now, this is individual. I have no problem in believing in, in corporate sin. I have no problem. I can, we'll teach on that at some point in time about how churches, I, I truly, transparently believe, are still living in corporate sin and have to go back and ask for forgiveness of things that maybe they didn't do. Okay? Been there, done that. Well, that, well we're the church through that. Okay? You know how hard it is to write letters to, pa to former pastors asking them, asking, asking for forgiveness of not confronting them whenever you should have? Oh, yeah. That, that, ooh. Done that. Writing people and saying, oh, look, we're sorry. We should have actually kicked you out of church a long time ago. Oh, that would hurt, right? But why do we not do that? Because we don't like to face up to our sin. Hey, I won't talk to you about your sin. You don't talk to me about my sin. We're all okay. The writer here of Hebrews, and I, and I keep saying, Paul, well, like, we all know it's not Paul. It's probably Paul, okay? Um, we're all going to get to heaven, and it's going to be... We know it's not Timothy, but Timothy talk is, is at the end of the letter. So, make it look... I don't care. The writer here is saying to you, lay aside every weight and lay, away, lay aside every sin. Now, you're dealing with sin. I know you are, because guess what? You're alive in a sin-fallen world. You're dealing with it. Probably dealing with multiples. But guess what? That is what we also need to be laying aside. Learning how to lay aside. How to put it off. Ephesians 4, put on righteousness. So that what? When we're looking at each other, it's not, oh, you've had that. No, no, no. It's not, I'm, oh, you have that sin. Let me stay away from you. You know what a church is designed to be in the, in the, in the form of unity? Oh, you have that sin? Let me, here, let me tell you from God's word. I want to show you. Can I show you what, what helped me? Can I show you what I had to do? Can I show you how to, how to help one another? Because that's what God's word calls us to do. To be that part of unity. I'm going to help you. You're in sin? Okay. I'm not running from you. I'm running towards you. Because that is what God's word calls us to do. To live a life with one another. You know? And sometimes living life this close, guess what? I love saying it because it makes you feel dirty. At some point in time, we're going to sin all over each other. And that just feels, that just feels wrong, right? But that's the truth. Why? Because we're church family. That is what we're called to do. i got to hurry just a little bit. So we went from get up. It's just to get ready. You need to be doing that before you ever walk into the church building. Oh, my goodness. That's smart. You're making the bar too hot. No, no, no. I'm just showing you where God's always put it. Number two is the doing. The perfection in the doing. Run the race. 
Think of this name. I love this. Practicality, right? Not theory. Not, oh, it'd be nice if you would. Do the things. What are the things? Christians have to run the race. Guess what? A race of service, a race of suffering, a course of active and passive obedience, all of those things are in the race. What do you do actively? What do you do passively? Are you obedient to what God's word says? Are you not? Are you, are you in constant defiance of it? That's the race. Some of you have been running longer than I have. Some of you have been running longer than I've been alive. Okay? And some of you will always be the eternally, you know, 40 and holy. I understand that. But guess what? God has a race in front of you to run. Number two. The race is already set. Don't believe me? Look, I love studying Genesis, but guess what? I guess what other book I love studying? Book of Revelation. Why do I like studying that? It shows me the finish line. Now, what happens if I don't get to cross the finish line here on earth? Well, I go back to 1 Thessalonians. Do not be ignorant, brother, for those that some that sleep. Isn't that what Paul wrote? Paul wrote it so that we would have to understand, hey, there's some people who didn't cross the finish line. Paul, hey, there's some people who, they're asleep. But don't worry about them, why? In a moment, the twinkling of an eye, the dead Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be done what? Called up to join them in the air. There's a race, and it's already set. I already know the beginning, I already know the end. Can I tell you what's also really fun? Remind, us, remind the devil ever so often where, his, where the finish line is. I always like doing that ever so often in my prayers as well. Can I tell you the hardest part of this? We must run. Now, I understand that this is, this is a sermon that's not, not necessarily for evangelism. I get that. This is for Christians. We must run. Look around. Again, look to your left, look to your right, look in front of you, look behind you. This is it. This is us. We must run. I can't run for you. I wish I could. I can't, uh, I can't do progressive sanctification for you. I can't, you know, I can't make you put off that sin. Which, which times I wish I could. I can't. I can't make you put on the holiness. I, I, all I can do is tell you that there's a race to be ran, to run, and we must run. But we must run like Christ. That's what verse 2 actually is. Looking, no, read back with me. Looking to Jesus. Let's back up. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus. Now, there's not a period there. If you have an English Bible, that's actually, that's actually one statement. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross. Here's your example. Jesus is your example. How did he run the race? Perfect. And what did they do to him? They killed him. And we go, oh, but this is such a discomfort to me. Jesus said, for, who for the joy was set before him. The joy. James chapter 1, one of my favorite verses. Consider all joy. All joy. Especially when you face trials of many or various kinds. When was the last time you had a prayer request? Hey, I just want to let the church know I'm, I'm in exceedingly joy because I'm going, through a tri I'm going through a tribulation right now. I am so happy. When was the last time you heard that? Why do we not hear that? Well, because we don't understand how the joy is put in front of us. We don't understand the trials that are put in front of us. And when we don't understand it, especially when we're not ready to put off those weights, we just live in a world where we're just constantly, I'm constantly, I'm looking only at myself. I'm, uh, uh, Martin Luther used a word called navel gazing, okay? And I love that, that theme because it's exactly what Christians today do. Martin Luther wrote that in 1600. We're navel gazing. What's that? I don't, I'm not looking at you. What am I doing? I can only see myself. Where are we going? I don't know. Because what God has called us to do. 
Let's finish this up with why. Look at what's in common. Okay, study these two verses. I want you to go back. We are what? Surrounded by witnesses. Now, I understand that the Hebrew writer here, the writer of Hebrews here, is really thinking about, because he just got done with chapter 11, you're talking about all the people that went before you. I get that. I got you. I got you. Move on. Let's talk about something else. Talk about all the other witnesses that, that are not mentioned there. How many people do you interact with in a given day, given week? They're all witnesses. They're all watching you. Since we are surrounded by, we might as well run. If the world hates you, guess what? I look at it now, I'm like, well, I'm, not, I'm just out of line, right? The world hates everything right at the moment. Where am I at the list? I don't know. I'm probably over there somewhere. We are running together the race of the force. One of the things I, I don't think that we get really well, because if we use this, this whole analogy of running a race, um, even if you watch the Olympics, which is probably about the only time I actually watch track races, uh, who, who doesn't want to see uh, Usain Bolt? I mean, you're good. Man's literally like um, All those races are what? Individual. Even in, in, in relay races. I mean, I understand it's a team, but what am I watching? I'm watching the individual, right? So I don't think that a track analogy is the best one here. Can I tell you a better one? I think probably works a little bit better for us. Is is more like like really bad cross country. Okay, you ever watch a cross country team practice? I don't know if you have. Taylor was in cross country for a little bit, and I love just watching the practice. You want to know why? You had the group that was out front. There's about three or four of them. They're setting that pace. And they're they're going at it. You know, they're sweating. They're doing all their things. And then there's a string of people in between, right? They're doing a little bit better, but they're not really doing a whole lot. They're not definitely not catching the front row. And then there's the mob, right? What happens at the mob? They're all running together. They're all supporting one another because they're all dying together, right? <laughs> I can't run anymore. Please help me. You can do it. Well, okay. Well, the whole mob will slow down. It's okay. That's actually the mentality that we really need as church. We're running together. Now, you may be a little ahead of me, you might be a little bit behind me, but guess what? We're running together. And I don't want to run so far ahead of you that you miss the next turn. I want to run with you. Part of unity is understanding that we are all running together. Jesus is the founder of our faith. I mean, it is the basis of why we do all that we do. So, let me go back to our little thing. We understand that the, the, there's things that change and there's things that don't change. And the, one of those things that do change is the who. Now, I want you to know, your challenge today is different than probably anything else I've ever done here. And that's okay. And I want you to know that I almost, almost, made you all wear name tags today. I was really close to it, and I didn't. Because we'll see how you do with this. Because if you don't do well with this, main tags are coming out next time, and we're going to play one of my favorite games, which is Meet My New Best Friend. <laughs> and that's where you go find somebody, and you have to tell me three things about them. Publicly. To everyone. Yes. If we don't know why, because that helps you learn people. Okay? Just want you to know where the bar could be. This is love. This is your challenge for this week, though. Okay? I told you, this whole series is going to be different. I want you to embrace the change of it. I want you to find someone that you may not know or have not talked to them in a while. Again, I want you to look around. we got time. I'm not letting you go as early as I would hope you to, but hey. I no longer apologize. I no longer tell you that I'm going to be early. Okay? I just stopped. Find someone that you may not know or you haven't talked to in a while. Now, if you know everyone, congratulations. Start again. Okay? Number two. I didn't think I had to put this in here, but I did. Introduce yourself. Hi. If I start the introductions, can I at least, can we at least have this conversation? Yes. I don't know what it is about COVID, 
but it's just to amplify this whole process. I'm not going to talk to you. Don't talk to me. <laughs> and you know what I do? I still talk. Hi, how are you doing? You just always explain to watch people. They just, they just sort of ball up. And go, I'm oh, good, good. How are you? Good, good, good. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Why? Because it introduces you. Number three. Begin the conversation. Now, I understand, I understand that your challenge this week is, is you're going, Pastor Mike, that's a little bit elementary. We cannot afford, in today's day and age, to continue to look at each other and go, I don't know you, but I'm not going to make an effort either. We, can, we no longer live in a day and time where we can just make an excuse. Oh, I'm pretty sure they know me. I introduce, I'll introduce myself to you at least five times before I ever cognitively think about, oh, I probably have already done this to you once or twice. Why? I want us to understand that this is us. I almost titled this whole series, This Is Us. I didn't. I probably should have. But I want you to understand that your challenge this week is unity. Your challenge this week is to meet people, to talk to them. I understand. Hey, you're still scared about it? Put your mask on. Stand six feet away. Look, you all are Southerners, okay? You're loud, all right? Be loud with one another. Be family, because that's what God has called us. I ask you to please sing. At this point in time, I want us to just close in a quick word of prayer. But as you're, as you're praying, I want to take just a moment because I want you to understand that this just the things that are running through my head, and I pray that you'll pray with me. Number one is I want to just pray to Hebrews 12 and 1. We are running together the race that is before us. As you're thinking about your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, the ones that are here, the ones that might be joining us on Facebook Live, I want you to be thinking about that to get right now. We are running the same race together. But the other one is, is, is from Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. And we'll probably have a sermon on that. We are one body. We are one family. This is who we are. And we are going to be a family that is unified. We're going to be a family that's full of unity. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you for our church family. I thank you for what you what you blessed us with. And God, I, I, I'm so thankful for what lies ahead of us. But God, as we go through today and as we go through these weeks, may we take on this challenge of introducing ourselves to meeting people, to, to sharing what you've, what you've done in and through us so that we might be able to do things together. God, I also pray that as we are doing this, I pray that that we would see one another and see how we can help one another. We understand things change. But God, we pray that you would just continue to bless. We pray that you continue to grow our family. God, we, we thank you for all of your wonderful blessings and we do ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Real quickly before we do end, I want to go ahead and let you know the uh, couple of things. This is all for the work day. Uh, work day is on Saturday, 17th. If you have a pressure washer and you would like to come and help, please see Bob or somebody from the uh, building and grounds. And they're going to start at 9 a.m. Is that correct, Bob? Yes, inside and out. Inside and out. So there's a lot to do. Uh, we're trying to get ready for the church picnic, which is at the end of the month. And I hope that you'll come by and do, join us with that. The sign up for the church picnic is right out there as well. Uh, you'll see a sign up there. We're providing the main dish. You'll see some things for you to come by and provide as well. So glad that you were here. Doug, I'm going to ask you if you would close us in a quick word of prayer. Most precious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you, God, for this sermon today, Lord. We ask God that as we leave this building, that we keep unity in mind and pull together as a church and brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for each and every blessing of life. We thank you for our health and strength. God, we ask that you be with the ones that are less fortunate than we are, wherever they might be. Be with the ones that are traveling and, and give them safe return. 
God, we ask that you just go with us. Lead, guide us, direct us. Each one of us. And what you have in store for us and what you have for us.